Okay, so reset the algorithm. My first business guest had to be Sophia. Sophia brings a vibrancy, a frequency as a self-made person, someone with no pedigree like myself, someone who's pulled herself up from the boots like myself. And I think rather than fake it, I used to fake it. I used to totally fake that I'd gone to college. I used to fake that I was from some family that meant something to other people. Like I, I postured that maybe somewhere, somehow I could be somebody. And when I met Sophia, the best thing about her was that she gave permission to be a successful entrepreneur and to be nobody from nowhere. And I think that so many of us are coming to the table with so little background or pedigree or permission that what's amazing about Sophia is she simply just showed up with a fucking desire to do it. And that's why Sophia matters. She was an important guest to have because no one has normalized failure more than Sophia. She has given permission to entrepreneurs to try, fail, succeed, and do it over and over again. And I think that that is the most incredibly generous and brave thing of her to do. And the other thing that I really love about Sophia is she is so openly transparent around her vulnerabilities, her fears, her mental health. Um, I don't want to call it struggles, but her mental health journey. And she should get a lot of credit for creating the girl boss generation. And in my opinion, girl boss generation will go down in history of being an incredibly pivotal, pivotal, pivotal moment and movement for women and feminists and intersectional feminism and the other thing about Sophia that I think is really important is that she gives everyone permission to evolve and change. So that is my favorite thing about her is that she is willing to pivot and expand and express herself in the uncomfortableness of that. But she's changed so much over the decade plus that I've known her. And she also pushes me to do that. I think she was the first person to call me when my company started to implode. She was like, Hey, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. And I was like, I'm, I'm good. And then she's like, okay, well, when you're ready to let me know how you're really doing, give me a call back. So I'm so excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Let's go. Hello. Hello. This is Mosh. Welcome to Reset the Algorithm, my brand new podcast, Sophia. Hi. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on your brand new podcast. Thank you. My accidental podcast that I started because nobody else was talking about the things I wanted to talk about. So here we are. All right. Then we're going to have a cool conversation. We are. Um, we're going to start backwards because we're okay. real friends. With we already started, uh, right? Yeah, it's recording. Good. Do you want to, who are you? So my name is Sophia Maruso. I am a serial entrepreneur and now a venture capitalist. And it's so funny because somebody uh, pointed out the other day that capitalist isn't my job title. And I was like, oh my God, that's weird. Like I never, that never actually landed. And the like, you know, 20 year old me would have been like throwing up. Like mm. um, I'm like rolling over in my like 20 year old grave just saying that loud, but um, I really enjoy it. So uh, I have a VC fund called Trust Fund now. Prior to that, I started a company called Nasty Gal uh, back in late 2006. Uh, bootstrapped it to 28 million in revenue, raised 50 million from Index Ventures and Thrive in 2012, built it to over 100 million in revenue, wrote a book along the way called Girl Boss that spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. They turned it into a Netflix series that Charlize Theron produced. Um, and yeah, Nasty Gal was a a fashion business. I started as an eBay store selling vintage clothing. And then we eventually, you know, I was curating from the market. We designed stuff. We had an in-house design team and it was, it was the hottest shit for like 10 years. Women's fashion on the internet. Do you miss it? Not really. Hmm. I mean, I, it was, the team was fun. Like there were elements of it that were so fun, like got to be creative um, all the time until eventually your CEO and your jobs becomes like CEOing and not doing the fun things that you started the business to do. But I do not miss managing, uh, 300 people or however many we had too many. 
Yeah, I don't think people understand what that means when they want to build a company. They don't account for the fact that you eventually are not a founder and entrepreneur, but you are a CEO and a CEO is not the same as being a founder or entrepreneur. And uh, you and I have firsthand experience um, on that topic. Many, <laughs> many learnings. Yeah. Um, we met a bunch of years ago. I think I originally, oh, did I meet you at South by? I think it was South by, but I remember very distinctly learning about you, reading about you and realizing that I'd never known a dropout, someone with no pedigree, someone who wasn't from a fancy family who had actually raised a ton of cash. You smoked, you cussed, you listened to <laughs> music, you, you were like a, riot girl, punk rock, like just this person. like yeah. you, you, I was like, holy shit. Like, cause everyone else was like, I went to Harvard and got a business, you know, and like I'm yeah. raising money and yeah. everyone was just like a cookie cutter, like, yeah, sort of like white feminist, like carbon copy. Um, but then you showed up on the scene, which I think to people like me who are like brown and off center and like not in that crew you were like oh like she's actually some one person i can look at that could be like an actual possibility for myself um which is why i think you have such a diverse following of people yeah. black brown gay queer plus i size. mean inherently everyone else is diverse <laughs> like just the you know the the flip side of what the business landscape looks like entrepreneur you know founders, venture capital, all of it. It's like, wow, it's diverse. It's like, yeah, everyone else who's not in it is like everyone else. So yeah, but, um, there, you know, you know, you say like, I came on the scene and it's like, there wasn't a scene, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there weren't white feminists. There was no, whatever that, whatever that means. I mean, I'm a white feminist, but like the, there was no conversation about feminism. Um, nasty gal, like at its core, uh, was imbued with a level of confidence that some people may say that like, oh, but it's close and it's shallow or it's, you know, capitalism. It's like, whatever. And it's like somebody put on a motorcycle jacket and felt like she could take on, take on the world. Like, that's awesome. Right. Um, so it was like, it was actually kind of like, you know, I don't be like, I was the first, but it was like, it was a weird place to be. And then you know, yeah, you can you know, you're like a total weirdo. And I was like, cool to connect with another weirdo. And so many other people who, who, you know, since, um, I think watched you and watched me or maybe read girl boss or, you know, have a log into Shopify or whatever, like, Oh shit. Like I don't have to carry a briefcase to be a business person. Like I don't have to go to business school to be a business person. <laughs> pretty cool. We're not alone. Well, it started, I think, a whole movement of people that I know we don't talk about the girl boss era um, anymore because because there were a lot of learnings and and um, somehow that's been like, I don't know, in my opinion, because it's it's easier for me to say because I'm on the outside. But I feel like that era has been a little bit weaponized against people. I still think that era is like insanely important because mm -hmm. um well, I mean, it created permission. I know hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs that for the first time in their entire life thought I can build a deck, raise money, build a company, whether it's a side consultancy or a side hustle or a real company or, I mean, they're all real companies, but I just think that that, um, well, it gave like permission to like a whole new era of ambition that I think women really struggle with having ambition. I think that's what you and I, like, that's what I love about you. I love, you are one of the most wildly, um, you know, self-taught, self-learned, competitive, but but not like in this awful, like, like a sharp elbows way. Like comp you're like really in competition with yourself. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's very evident whether you're playing poker, whether you're like, I was, I was telling, um, uh, Kayla and Sarah, I was like, Sophia is one of the most, like, she does nothing 0%. It's either like, I'm, you know, if she's going to play poker, she's going to play poker with the best poker players on the planet. If she's going to 
Like, if she's going to ride a bike, she's going to tour de France. Like, she's going to go learn from the guy that... No, but, like, you, like I'll, I'll sometimes watch her content. I'm like, is she actually in Italy or Europe right now? Like, on this fucking Road bike, bike that is, like, hurting? Hurting. Like, it hurts my crotch to even look at you doing it. But... You got to wear those diaper shorts. You got to wear the bib. Yeah. What? Anyway. What is that, Sophia? Like, why can't you do anything a little bit? Um, well, doing everything a little bit means that I'm doing nothing really well sometimes. So there is that. Um, I don't know, because I love learning and it only works if I'm engaged. Like if I'm half engaged or if somebody assigns me a task, like you're going to write another book. You've got a follow up book. It's like I never had a follow up book because I just don't have a follow up book in me. And I've tried. Um, and if it's not there, it's just like I can't generate it, which is challenging, which is why I'd be really bad employee um but i i really like learning like i love you know being in over my head i'm okay not being good at things um i'm okay asking questions and i think when you're comfortable with that and have people around you that know more than you they're super stoked to to show you the ropes and how things work and i think a lot of people aren't comfortable like raising their hand and saying like i want to do this i don't know how where do i start you know, poker. It's just like there was a time when nobody knew how to play poker. It's just like sit down, whatever. Like, you know, find a teeny tiny game. I should be playing teeny tiny games. I've been playing like crap lately. Um, I played last night. But, um, you know, Did and you just, because I, just because I have like the right spandex or whatever and, you know, a road bike doesn't mean I'm like a good, like a great, like like I can like, you know, climb crazy hills or I'm even doing it all the time. It's like, you know, my boyfriend is a, you know, endurance athlete and took me on cool bike rides, but I don't know if I'd be doing it by myself on a trip to Italy. It would be cool. We'll see. I mean, it's fun watching it. It makes for good content. Mm -hmm. Um, So... When I was going through a very public downfall or tumble of my company, I think you were, well, I remember you would called me. You were like, hey, like, just reaching out. <laughs> I will never forget that conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, I think you're like a Sherpa to a lot of us um, in life in the sense that uh, you've created, uh, first you created the permission to be ambitious. Uh, you created um, the, uh, path for us to ask for things, even if our resumes didn't justify it or people didn't justify it. And then you created the pathway for us to not, for us to really like lean in with our full chest into our failures. Mm -hmm. And it's gotta suck being the person that's like constantly doing that fucking first. Is that hard? Um, it's so much easier watching other people do it after you. (laughs) I mean, maybe it's easy, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I'm not like uniquely damaged or I'm not uniquely like, you know, entrepreneurship is hard. And so no, no. Um, and it doesn't really happen that often. And it's like awesome to be a big sister in a lot of ways, whether it's, yeah, like, Hey, let me share with you what's hard. Uh, I mean, you just like show up. Resilience is just not going away. It's not that hard. You just don't go away. It's like most of us have to work, so we stick around. And, you know, if you have any kind of a platform, it's in your best interest to continue like using it rather than being like, I'm going to disappear forever. But also it's like, it depends on like what kind of shit you pulled and what you like got, uh, slaughtered for publicly because some people really should probably step back and take a break. I don't know, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's funny. I guess the book like, yeah, gave a generation women, um, license to go after their dreams. And then, you know, several years later, um, watching me face plant, you know, they'd all, probably also girl boss too close to the sun or whatever you want to call it. And it's like, okay, now we're in our thirties or that book. in like when I was like 27, like, okay, now we're like a little older and we've all like everybody, 
you know, the naivete um, that, you know, my book had that so many of, I mean, everybody has when they're, when they're young, um, you know, becomes something where it's like, oh shit, like things aren't that easy. And I think, you know, it's cool if, if my story can help someone feel okay, like taking big swings and, uh, you know, blowing it once in a while and getting back up again, then that's really gratifying. That's super cool. Um, and, you know, I'm just doing the same. It's normal. It's just doing it in front of other people is what's different. It's just like everybody's, well, everybody's blowing it. I think, I think one of the things that I... I don't think you really like give yourself the credit you deserve. And I don't personally feel like anyone flew clo too close to the sun because pay equality hasn't happened and gender parity hasn't happened. And women are systematically in minorities or, you know, we're nowhere close to, uh, you know, inclusivity for many of the things that we can talk about later. But so I'm going to just, that's just my perspective. I feel like, there's still a lot of work to be done and I'm grateful that some people were brave enough to ask. Um, and I'm grateful that some people normalized failure, wipeouts, divorces, bankruptcy, um, IVF child, like whatever it was like fucking yeah. all of it. Like, and yeah. you've been brutally, brutally, like the most brutally honest of almost anyone I know. Yeah. Um, I remember one day waking up and watching you take your Prozac on social. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like my morning routine and it's like, everyone's like ice bath, you know, writing in my journal, you know, uh, staring into my partner's eyes for half an hour or like, you know, whatever, putting your butthole in the sun. I don't know. Uh, it's like, no, no. I wake up and I drink coffee on an empty stomach and like probably ruin it. No, I drink some water, but it's like, I still, I'm still like super not well adjusted as a human adult. But, um, it's funny. People are like, ha ha ha. That's the thing. It's just like, I, you know, I don't take myself too seriously. And if, um, you know, who, who's for you will find you and who's not for you will go fade into the, you know, background and I just generally like entertaining myself. So part of it is like maybe selfish and ever. Do you think people get your sense of humor? Hmm, I don't know. I think so. It's a weird question, you know? I, I find that people always are like, like they, they're, they're like really intri intri in, intrigued and entertained by you, but I don't, uh, someone was talking to me about your website recently, the the trust fund website. Uh huh. And I was like, that is a very Sophia like inside joke with Sophia. Because if I was just looking at it from the outside, I'd be like, you know, it's, it's a very it's a very like a uh, trust fund. It's very uh, white elite. Yeah. You know, golf coursey. Funny. I, it's giving dynasty to me. Like it's I just giving... invested in a company called dynasty, by the way, which is amazing. And they do trusts. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. a funny, oh, I want to hear three, about that. Three early Carta guys. They're, um, yeah, they're going to kill it. But, um, yeah. Tell me about like the sense Every... of humor piece of like, what's the tongue in cheek about you that people either get, don't get or do get. They pretty much, you know, they all get it. And if they don't get it, it's like, whoa, like you actually, you're like a copy editor. You read things literally. There's no, so like, you know, there's people who were like, you know, I've pitched to people for trust fund and they've been like, so tell me about trust. Like trust, like fund is descriptive. Tell me about trust. And I'm like, I just like want to ha hang out. But it's like, you know, the people who invest in trust fund are kind of like my bosses. But at the same time, it's like, pretty clear after a little while where it's like, okay, you're like a really institutional investor. You write $50 million checks. My fund is too small for you. And you're like a walking spreadsheet. So it's going to be really hard to, uh, to like jive or whatever you want to call it. For the most part, I think people get it, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of a clown. And, uh, if I, you know, say something stupid at a conference, people are usually like, ha ha ha. I don't know. And it's like, when I suck at something, I'll just like make someone laugh. If I don't have anything inspiring to say, I'll just try to, I'll make myself a clown. And then even if people aren't learning something, they're generally like disarmed and endeared and 
charmed in some way. So it's like, you know, it, it works. It's weird to talk about like your own personality and, you know, mechanisms of how, you know, you, I mean, this is how I operate in the world. It's my personality, but it's also, these are like my humor or whatever you want to call it. Like my personality or, or what, like my brand and my business and my contribution, um, all right on my relationships. So it's like, if it didn't work, like we wouldn't be here. Um, and it doesn't always work. But for the people that don't get it, like, that's totally fine. I mean, I can go to, like, the Upfront Summit and everyone there is like, oh, my God. Like, guys are like, the best name ever. <sighs> Why didn't I think of that? It's like, yeah, they didn't do that with Girl Boss, obviously. Nasty Gal, they were like, oh, interesting. Um, but, like, it's really fun and funny for guys to be like, oh, my God, it's so good. And, you know, I've got these bucket hats uh trust fund bucket hats and they're like they're really cool it's like beautifully embroidered and people who grew up with trust funds love them because they think it's funny people who mm. didn't grow up with trust funds are like haha <laughs> so it's like everybody thinks they're funny and they're actually pretty cool it's not just useless merch so there's just like there's a play on it and there's nobody if somebody's offended that there's like Ralph Lauren ads, you know, from the 80s on my website were, you know, Buzzy, whatever his name, Buzz, I don't know what, some guy, some yuppie model, I don't know what, uh, is like walking around with like a, you know, cricket stuff. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know what cricket is. Um, that's fine. I, I just, I, I just always wonder whether or not, um, well, some of us are, testing boundaries on like media and communications and verbiage. Like the whole tagline for this podcast is ending the era of influence, which for me, I think is funny because my entire last business was like the fucking, like, like I'm ending the era of influence after creating the era of influence. And you're saying that the girl boss era was flying too close to the sun. And now you're a trust fund VC, which is like, yeah. I don't know. It's an inside um, joke to ourselves, I guess, but I don't know. I think, I think, it's, I think it's, it's really, I think it's really important. Like you have a podcast, obviously you're influential. So good luck, you know, ending influence, not to, you know, uh, you know, I know that's the, like the thesis of the conversation, but like influences, influence can make such an impact. So if you're talking about influencers, sure. If you're talking about like, you know, waste of time, um, shallow stuff but like influential people change the world like influential people change people's lives you know being influential like so brave doing it for power doing it for vanity those are that's something totally different so it's like what is your perspective on influence is is an interesting um approach uh which you know we can talk about i don't it's not something i spent a ton, a ton of time thinking about but you know you know, you and I are here on video. People are going to listen to those and it's going to influence them. And that's okay. That's actually kind of cool. But it also oh. is like, I think you're speaking about it on a more cultural level is my guess. <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm probably in the, uh, I'm very interested in like the era of coalition, which I think, mm -hmm. um, you, you are doing, but you're maybe not thinking of it like in those words, which is like, I'm more interested in being community with other people that are like creating a coalition about different movements. And so I'm a minority investor. You're a minority investor. We work with other minority and female investors. Um, we're both friends with Ariane Simone from the fearless fund. Um, I'm more interested in like, like I, I think for me, influencing was like one-to-one -one. and then now I'm interested in, me and a coalition of other people are standing around like certain beliefs and I'm willing to compromise certain things in order to like do things as a group, if that makes any sense, because maybe I feel a little bit alone and isolated in influence. And I feel, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, like 
one of the downsides of being an entrepreneur is that you often are really isolated and feel alone. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in not feeling alone. And so maybe I'm thinking about coalition building versus influencing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's how I think about it. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's very wise. I think it's, you know, we, we can get lost in the myopia. I don't know what you want to call it, but the, you know, the world where it's individual contributors and individuals voices and, you know, there's subject matter experts and there are people that have their own unique way of sharing something. But, um, it's a lot easier when you have people around you with a similar point of view or even people who are willing to challenge you um, and to amplify your voice along with them and to collaborate, right? Like competing is like boring, like there's room for everybody. Um, and why not, you know, use your mutual influence to make an impact? You know, I'm an only child and probably a doomed to be a solo GP, solo founder, like, whatever maybe i'll die alone i don't know uh i think about it uh but i spend a lot of time with other investors and we share everything and sure we might be competing for deals at some point but it's like it's kind of not worth it not to collaborate with people when it's an opportunity to accelerate what you're doing individually being able to learn things individually and then being able to um, scale together and make an impact, you know, investing in companies is making an impact. And if, you know, early emerging managers, which we are, are able to move more swiftly to, um, become really good at this job or fill in the gaps of what we don't know, we're able to make an impact and influence collectively in a way that, um, you know, it's just, it will take a longer time to feel your way around in the dark individually. And what impact means, you know, then, then we get into what impact means because, you know, you, the way you make an impact is very different from the way I make an impact or the kinds of things that, of course, I care about what you care about, but I'm not an expert in what you're talking about on social media all day. Um, <laughs> I'm, 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 it's helpful, but I'm like, my roof is leaking. You know, everyone's like, I'm like one of those people, it's like, my life is, you know, it's like, I've, I've already have all these stakeholders who want my help, and then it's like, oh fuck, like, there's like genocide happening, and thanks for, thanks for making it easy to understand what's going on, as much as we can. You know, I, I don't think I've actually ever said this publicly, but um, I sort of made a big decision after everything that I experienced with BeautyCon that I didn't really want the next era of my career to be so public. And I wanted mm -hmm. the privacy to be able to try things, test things, build things, really build out my team, really have like, a, a, like privacy to go through several different companies and ideas. And so I haven't really shared myself professionally publicly in some time mm -hmm. because I, frankly feel that I deserve the time to like you know what I do all day for work but the world probably thinks I'm like a full-time women life freedom Middle East activist and so <laughs> it's been really funny because people are like oh like what are you doing for work are you like mostly in the nonprofit space now and you're like no I just don't want to share my stuff publicly yeah. anymore because yeah um because I, I feel like I deserve privacy and I can use my platform for something different right now. So yeah, we'll see. But I yes, exactly what you're talking about, you know, it's like after, you know, I left girl boss and when all these crazy takedowns happened during black lives matter. Um, and then, you know, all the girl bosses got kind of like wiped. Uh, I was like, I took a book out and pitched it called business class. And it was literally just like, let me show you some things. And it's like, people don't follow me because I can teach them what product market fit means. They follow me because of my voice and my story and the unique things I have to share or I'm willing to share, whatever. I don't know why I haven't taken a survey. Um, and it was turned down by every publisher, but I was hiding. It was like my way of hedging. It's like, I'm going to use my platform, but I don't really want to infuse myself into it because then 
you know, I could be held accountable to something. It's like, be really hard for you to get like taken down talking about what it is that you're talking about. So it's, it's brave, but it's also, yeah, it's a personal choice and you do deserve your privacy. And if you do have a platform to make an impact, you can choose how you make that impact. And it doesn't have to be fucking talking about yourself, uh, which is somehow I've made now the second, not my career on, but it's like, it's a part, it's what we're talking about. Um, but I, I remember being there and being like, I'm not going to, this isn't about me anymore. I'm going to move into this like thought leader space. And then I don't know. I just, I'm there, but also I'm comfortable. I'm like, I've like returned and I'm comfortable just being like, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know. Hopefully, you know, the can- cancel culture era is, has chilled out a little bit. I feel like it's chilled out a little bit. Um, so I'm just hoping that's the case and not really doing anything that would, make me cancelable but there's also people who uh didn't do you know it's like whatever that means you know i obviously cannot stand cancel culture and i loathe in my pit every single journalist that felt that it was their job to take down female founded companies for things that they would never take down Mm -hmm. men for, you know, and I, I mean, I've said that publicly, I think it's distasteful and, um, the entitlement of that, but that's like, you know, white feminism versus intersectional feminism is intersectional feminism is you're fucking all human. We all make mistakes. No one's perfect. And, um, in my opinion, women have not had generations to step into power and to know how to culturally do these things so of course we wiped out the first generation that took a shot but that's not me and i have criticisms of a zillion million female founders i just wouldn't do that publicly because i'll just tell them directly i mean you and i have had some insanely direct conversations about (laughs) all the ways no i really i i want i i admire that about you and respect that you um have called me to say like, what could I do better to support minority founders? You were a supporter of Beauty United. I've, I've been impressed with all of the dynamic conversations you've had with a lot of minority founders. I've seen you go out of your way to support Ariane Sapone, which means a lot to me. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of other GP women step up to support so what's weird. going on. So weird. What is up with that? Why is I, everyone no. not supporting Ariane Simone and the Fearless Fund? So weird. It is Why so are all weird. of this female, where is all the female it's GPs and investors? Deal. Like the implications of this are insane. Like this is a, this is like an existential, um, like lawsuit or whatever you want to call it. Like this is, yes. this, no, is, this like, is historic and symbolic and like, you know, rooted in hate and like so, so wrong and has money behind it. And like, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it is really crazy how I haven't heard all, more about this and of what's going on with fearless fund. And I'm guessing you've talked about it on your podcast. I have not, which is why you are, you're really my first business guest. Um, Yes. And it was appropriate. I had to have you be my first business guest because everyone else in life sequenced is behind you. Um, but I will be having Ariane and a bunch of other folks come on, but I've been talking about this dude, Edward Bloom and his obsession with overturning affirmative action and now going after the fearless fund. And I think, I don't know why every single woman, investor GP is I somehow maybe they think it doesn't impact them because they're not black, but he's not going after just black female founded companies. This is going to roll back, you know, whether you're getting a vendor agreement from Walmart or you're a, a quota, right? Requirement from a company, whether we're talking about diversity and inclusion, like this is, Um, I think it's a crisis. I don't understand why everyone's not talking about it. I feel like we should be doing everything we can to push back on this, but people are not. Why are you thinking people are not? Why are, why is everyone not stepping up for this? I'm going to stop us here for a second and talk about the importance of fighting for diversity and inclusion programs. 
So Sophia and I are both very passionate about supporting our friend and colleague, Ariane Simone, and the Fearless Fund. And the why is because women, and women of color particularly, are nowhere close to gender pay equality, opportunity equality, inclusion. And while diversity and inclusion's on the chopping block right now because somehow people have amnesia about why we made all of these big movements over the past four years. Somehow everyone's just blanked out the need for this stuff. Um, just as a reminder, women are still 60 cents on the dollar. That's white women, uh, women of color, black women are closer to like 42 to 39 cents on the dollar, uh, venture funding, uh, women are getting 2% of the billions of dollars in venture funding and black women particularly are getting closer to 0.039%. Like make that make sense. Make it make sense that you have such a qualified group of founders and entrepreneurs that somehow can't even get to the table, much less get a check. And rather than continue to invest in these programs, rather than move these programs forward or better yet, rather than live in a society where these programs don't need to exist because people understand that we are equal, that liberation matters. No, we're going to roll them back and we're going to let assholes like Edward Bloom overturn affirmative action and now come and sue the Fearless Fund and every other fund on the planet that wants to specifically invest in black people and women of color and women. So if this program is successful, his passionate endeavor to overthrow diversity and inclusion now that he's overthrown affirmative action because you guys were asleep at the wheel and didn't notice, that means women are not going to be able to get inclusive vendor agreements at companies. We're not going to see huge corporations doling out checks to investment funds that invest in women in black people, in minorities, in queer people, you're going, I mean, you're already seeing it on college campuses because, you know, you're seeing so many people of color and women, you know, being successful at college campuses without affirmative action. So in short, Sophie and I have stepped up to strongly support the Fearless Fund and to loudly announce our camaraderie. And we are welcoming every other female minority venture partner, private equity partner, hedge fund partner to get up and stand up and support diversity and inclusion, and most importantly, gender parity in a society that doesn't have it. And as usual, we're making black women do all the labor working for all of us. Per use, white women, just saying, it's a good time to stand up and take note. And back to my chat with Sophia. I mean, speaking of the algorithm, uh, I think, I think it could be getting lost in the algorithm. I think, um, like this is a crazy thing to say, but I think Ari, I mean, Arian's, she does so many things and she does so many things successfully. I want updates. Like I want to get an email that says like, here's the latest, here's something you can post like here's, and I've gotten that, but like, I want a political campaign level calm strategy that goes out to as many people as possible that people forward that they tag their friends in I mean this all happened this has all happened before like dear Ivanka do you remember that like yeah. it's like dear fucking Ivanka like compared to this is like I mean sure she has influence dad 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 whatever but like it's this is different like um so part of it I think is you know it's in the press but um you know it's like I, I need, I need someone to make it really easy for me to be like, oh shit, this is what's happening. Or, you know, it's just, it's easy to get lost in, I mean, it's such an excuse, but it's, it's easy for this stuff to get lost when we're all like struggling and we're busy and, you know, navel gazing and trying to fix our hair or whatever. I don't know. Exercise, drink water. Well, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world, right? Like the world is, mm, like, we're not in a good place right now. No. Like, have we ever only... been? Like, in the history mm. of humanity? <laughs> um, probably the answer is no, but never <laughs> has the world's traumas, injustices, and extremism has never been so, like, blatantly in our face. Mm -hmm. And 
um, democracy feels fragile. Our rights feel fragile. Human rights feel fragile. Um, empathy is like not something that people are super focused in on right now. Um, everyone's really focused in on like righteousness. So we yeah, are nuance is like nuance doesn't drive clicks. Um, yeah, like if I make a video about love, like it will get no views. Yeah. If I make a video yeah. about I hate blank, you know, fuck this blank, it will get like a million views. And I've tried it like 17 times and I've been amazed at how much the algorithm favors trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a really favors. good clip. I'm going to get a really good clip for your social. Can you just list out all the things that you want to say fuck and end that sentence with? Like, fuck, just can't, like, you've got such a list. Like, I do. Fuck the Islamic Republic of Iran. Fuck gender apartheid, right? I could just go on and on. Go and on. on. Fuck Edward Bloom. Fuck cancel culture. Fuck all the writers who canceled, like, female founders. Fuck all the investors who made my life and your life hell. <laughs> For sure, fuck those people. Yeah. Definitely cool. fuck Trump. Fuck Trump. Yeah, All fuck day. Trump. Fuck Trump. Yeah. Fuck nation states, militaries, collective punishment. Fuck starving people. Fuck taking hostages. Fuck. I really can't stand religion these days. Yeah. At fuck all. Dogma. Fuck dogma. It's like. Absolutely. Like, I'm like, I'm so grateful that I was not raised with a flag, with a religion, with a, like somehow I would have to answer to something, not myself or my family. Like, I'm really grateful that I don't have like a conflict of crisis in terms of identity. Like, whew, thank you know, God for that. And you're, 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 you know, you have an identity that is very complex for a lot of people. It's not that difficult. Um, and the amount of grace that you move through the world with allowing people to, I mean, technically misgender you, um, is like, I've never seen anything like that. You're not like, God damn it. My identity is writing on this. And it is, it's your identity. It's important. Like this is, you know, your, your gender or lack thereof, <laughs> um, is like, you know, that's a really important part of your life. And changing a pronoun is a really big deal. And I've been around people who have been misgendered and they're like, they're just like livid and I get it. But like you give people grace to, you educate people and you give them space to like, and you're willing to, um, you know, to, to take some hits or feel misunderstood to let that happen. And it's a very generous thing. Hmm. I was, I think, very um, maybe transphobic about myself for a really long time. I, um, Roya always makes fun of me because I would hang out with her non-binary trans friends and I'd be like, I don't get them. Like, I just don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. So um, now I just feel like, like, I just really, I know I've said this to you before, but like, I really love myself right now. It's like this very weird, like I have gender euphoria extremely. Like, it's like, um, I've just been like in a good mood for a few years nonstop because of it. And so whenever people are uncomfortable with how to deal with me, I'm just kind of like, I feel for them in this weird way. Like, I'm like, oh, like you yeah i don't i don't really feel mad about it ever um because i guess i'm like really tapped i'm like just high on my own <laughs> gender euphoria that's so amazing know. so special and i know it's been so hard for you to get to that place and you've you yeah. know it's like you had so much anger um and to be where you are now it's like you know it's like there's a lot of people who watch you be like a very angry person and um, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't really matter, but it's like cool to watch that transformation. Um, and everybody should be given that opportunity. People don't, um, people don't give one another 
opportunity to change or mm. they're like surprised. You know, there's like a PR campaign that we build around who we are and our identity and what we do. And I'm this entrepreneur, I'm edgy, I do nasty gal, or I'm Moj and I do beauty stuff. And, you know, I run this and I'm a big boss and whatever it is, you know. And when you decide to move on or change your identity or move into investing or be like, fuck girl boss for me it's like kind of you know it is post girl boss right like I agree with everybody um but I'm still the girl like it's like I wrote that book 11 years ago you know so it's just it's crazy to still have my identity so tied to something that I've moved beyond so long ago um and it's cool that people care and that they're paying attention um but other people's perceptions of you become a hangover and baggage that you have to carry around when you're trying to reinvent yourself. And I think it's important to, you know, surround yourself with people who will let you change and change your mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't like this anymore. I disagree with what I agreed with before because I'm more informed or, you know, I want to, I want to be different tomorrow. You know, and I don't, I don't do this. When I was younger, I used to tell myself like, I want to choose my life every day. And that's really hard. It's like, if I wasn't doing this six months ago, would I still be doing it now? If I wasn't in this relationship for the last, you know, however long, would I still choose it? Or am I, you know, is it, is this, are these things in my life now, like a sunk cost that I'm, you know, hanging on to because I've, invested in this and that and I'm going to stay miserable in this you know job as a CEO of a company with 300 people because I owe it to them and this is all I got to ride on and you know there's no other option for me and it's like there's always another option um yeah well you my friend are a non-binary thinker and that's how your brain, your left brain, right brain, non-binary thinker. So that's hmm. why you can move like that. Um, I think the most loving thing a person can do for someone else, and I've always said this and I feel passionate about this, is give them the opportunity to change. Mm-hmm. That's, that is, to me, like the biggest expression of love um, because we're human and we like are we regenerate every seven years so of course I'm not gonna be who I was when I met you and if you don't let people change I think that's really mean it's not like a very kind thing to do you know everybody's I agree but everybody's got their own shit and it's easy to take Mm -hmm. that personally and people Mm -hmm. protect themselves for their own reasons and so much of the time it has very little to do with you um I Right. So yes, like that's Gen- something that you can give them because maybe they don't have the bandwidth or empathy to let you change. And if they can't, then you definitely don't want them around and you can't force it. And hopefully at some point they come around and see you thriving and see you having perspective and see you as you know, someone who's yeah evolved. And can say, oh, wow, okay, I am I f- now feel safe enough to, like, re-engage or whatever. Um, but so much of the time it's, like, about them. Well, <clears throat> I have two short que- questions for you, but I'll say that I find when I ask people to give me that opportunity, they have almost always given me that chance. If I've, if I've asked someone, like, hey, yeah. would you give me the opportunity to like reset this relationship with you. Like I find that people do. So maybe that's why I'm kind of not like going to flip out if someone misgenders me because Mm -hmm. like, I don't think they mean it. You know what I mean? Like they're not trying to do that on purpose. They just, Mm -hmm. they're just kind of, they don't know. So it's like, I don't know. I don't think that it's intentional. Um, I don't think so. Um, what, what do you, what's a question? What's a question that you wish people would ask you? More about trust fund, because that's what I'm doing now. People love to talk about, like, my past and perspective. I'm like, 
I'm blah, 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 but it's like, oh my God, what's way more important is what I'm doing with it now. Okay, I've done stuff with it, but like, what am I doing? What am I doing now? Right? Like, you so know, tell I, us, what are you I'm doing now? Company, like 17, 18 years ago, right? Like, um, let me change. Let me tell a new story. And it's like, it's not, you know, there's a thread, a very thick, like, silver lining that becomes, uh, you know, Falcor and the never ending story or something. But, and there, yeah, there's like a through line um, with everything that I've done. And so it's like, you know, sharing that evolution is like a really exciting, really gratifying thing. And just literally sharing that, not like publicly, but sharing it like one-to-one -one with the founders I invest in. Um, and then to my like audience and being able to give them value now that I've extracted so much value in my career that I feel like I'm in a position to just harvest it and it's like free and it's sitting there. It's so fun to see what I can do with it. Like, can I make an intro to, you know, the CMO at Savage X Fenty who I don't know? Yep. You know, like I'll just, you know, I can cold email people and get people on the phone. Like, you know, now there's conversations my founders who are just emerged from, you know, Y Combinator are able to have um, that they wouldn't necessarily be able to otherwise. And that's just like, you know, we've both made careers punching above our weight and it's never gonna, you know, like we'll always be lightweights compared to the people who show up with more advantage, but we'll also um, have a different kind of weight to throw around. Um, and as outsiders, uh, as entrepreneurs, outsiders, as, you know, people in the venture world, entrepreneurs you ask what motivates me and it's like let's see what I can do like it's kind of just like you know who let me in here like okay watch yeah and it is kind of competing with myself I guess a little bit it's more just like how can I be Mickey and Fantasia and just like spray magic everywhere like that's fun um and you know seeing what lands is uh the most fun <clears throat> well investor well founders are constantly hitting me up um to get an introduction to you so i feel like you've successfully transitioned into becoming a highly coveted investor so what cool. are you investing in yeah what are you investing in so i'm investing in companies that help people start and build businesses um which and, and largely in stuff I wish I had. So I built Nasty Gal pre-cloud, pre-API, you know, rubbing two sticks together. I had a high school friend slice up a PSD that I, just like the first Photoshop file I probably made. And he had to hard code and add the cart button onto a product detail page. You know, it was like, there was no Shopify, there was no Stripe, there was no Gusto. So to watch all of these incredible products emerge, for people to start businesses and for the people who, you know, like you, like me, you know, the generation of people who like read Girl Boss and were like, oh my gosh, like I'm a brow tattoo artist and I can be an entrepreneur. Whoa, I'm a business person. That's nuts. I don't just work in the, you know, back of a salon. Like I've got a brand and an Instagram account and whatever. It's like all those tools are out there for us now. Um, to bring what's really special about us and our ideas and our you know, knowledge or our personality or whatever it is, and this is, you know, relates to, you know, a teeny tiny little small brick and mortar store to the creator economy, to venture back founders who now um, have these tools that can allow them to focus on what they're really great at. Where, you know, 15 years ago, you know, the time spent figuring out like, 1099s or, you know, filing, you know, paying payroll taxes or anything like that was just, it all felt so overwhelming. You can go into Gusto now and push a button and like, you know, issue 1099s or W9s or whatever, 1099s to people. Um, so it's everything from dental, a dental labor marketplace called Toothio, which allows a dental you know, hygienist to book a shift at a dentist's office and 
work for herself for the first time and set her own hours. It's an app that allows someone to work for themselves. That's it. It's an app. It's like a, maybe a few years old. Like that's that that changes so many people's lives in a way that without that piece of software, you know, that person wouldn't be able to work on their own time and have a flexible schedule. Like uh that's that's nuts. And to me that's what eBay did for me. Um it's like there's a framework I like do some stuff and holy shit, like my life changed. So I understand the power of these products to change someone's life. And I, you know, have a lot of empathy for the end user who is feeling their way around in the dark. So I have a very kind of like visceral knowledge of what it is that people need to demystify entrepreneurship for them or that allows them to work for themselves. Um, and that gives me a really interesting kind of advantage. I also see these as consumer products. So a big question I get is, why aren't you investing in consumer? And I have as an angel investor, I did liquid death and I've done, you know, different brands, eat sleep, but I've put enough stuff in landfills. That's one. I already spent half my career trying to build a billion dollar consumer business, not interested in spending my second half of my career building a consumer business, but my understanding of the consumer mindset paired with the end user of the products that I'm investing in is a very powerful combination because someone choosing Squarespace over Shopify will largely choose it because of word of mouth, because of the brand. There's so many more reasons someone choosing just works over Gusto you know, what's on the website? What is the language? How are you articulating the value proposition? This isn't like B2B enterprise SaaS sales anymore. Those of us who are the 99% of, I mean, not anymore or whatever, this is like a biker tattoo, but like <laughs> the bulk of people out there starting businesses with the software don't know what SaaS is, software as a service. They don't know, they're not putting out an RFP to choose one of these platforms. They are consumers. I was, you know, okay, eBay's B to B to C, but like I wasn't a B, I was a C. There was also no other choices. So there was no Etsy. It's not like I was, you know, choosing between one thing or another. But um, today, business owners are consumers of these products and how these company, the companies I invest in articulate uh, their value and offering to them is something I make a big impact on. And then I've got this whole other thing where I have a lot of relationships <laughs> and then have this platform of people who, you know, are building businesses or are inspired to because they read my book or watch my story or whatever. Um, so then I can amplify this to a really qualified audience of a million followers across, you know, the social landscape um, who want to use this stuff and for, you know, to whom, for whom this is a service. Um, to share it with them and not me pushing like a, you know, vitamin or something, which is also a nice thing if it works, but just different. It's life changing, you know, vitamin's not going to do that much for you, but Shopify might. And, and this is why I would call you a coalition builder because you yeah. think about communities at scale and you open source your resources. So yeah, that's why. Your coalition, even though you don't cool. know it. Well, think of Do you, you know as Ashley a... Mayer from Coalition VC? I don't, but should I? Yeah, she ran comms at Glossier. Um, okay. And where else? I think like Social Capital. Uh, cut that out if I'm wrong, but she's awesome. Okay. Um, and you should know her. We are both spending our days meeting with founders, deploying capital, investing in companies. You are investing primarily in seed stage, correct? Yeah, seed. And I'm investing primarily in seed and A. And we're both female minority founders turned investors. And how are you, I guess, how can people help you? What are the things that people can do to help you support mm -hmm. you? Teach me the nuts and bolts of running a fund because I have all the other 
ingredients to make me super successful, but doing this as a job versus doing it as an angel is very different. And I take it very seriously. Okay, so the ask is give you money to invest <laughs> and uh, help you better operate your fund and teach you about the things you don't know. And um, I think that's a great ask. I think a lot of people would love to support you and I like supporting you. Um, what should we do together this year as a goal? I know you have to go, but what's a good project for you and I to organize around as coalition builders and people who want to be, I'd like to see more women and operators on people's cap tables. That's why mm -hmm. I originally wanted to do this. What, what are things that we should be doing together? I mean, we should be co-investing depending on, you know, what sectors you're focused on. We should be sharing notes on fundraising and data rooms. Um, we should be getting together to commiserate on common challenges that we're both having and share how we're grappling with them and even solutions that we're finding or working on because we're both always working on them. Um, and I don't know, have a drink. I don't know if you do that anymore, but I do. I don't really drink, no. Yeah, I like Negronis. Um, I like a gluten-free beer once in a while, but yeah, I don't know. Drinking and I are not so like, I don't know. It just doesn't do anything for me, but I will take an edible or I took, I'll take psychedelics sometimes. Yeah. I'm like an old man. I'm like on a different trip. I'm like, I'm like smoking capris and drinking. I know. I saw you smoking a capri playing poker and I was like, what the fuck? They're like, not like a, there's like nothing in there. They're like, it's, there's it it's, like a menthol. You know, oh. I think it's better than vaping. Those things are addictive. I'm not addicted. I'll like have a cigarette once in a while, mm. but also I'm just having a hard time and I'm just like a little bit like, fuck it right now, but I'm not well, like, if a anyone smart. has any, do you want to leave an, any final words or any final thoughts? The world is in a, in a meltdown of a crisis. Or 200 and something days from an election? Help. <laughs> <laughs> Help. And I'll, uh, you know, in, in the, in the cry for help, uh, meaning of the word and in the contribute, uh, sense fucking help. Yeah. Well, I'd like everyone to vote. I'd also like if anyone has an escape plan, um, they want to they want a coalition build on escape plan somewhere that we can move where we can be free from theocracies, uh, where they value life equally, where gay people and queer people and women are safe. Like I would be happy to relocate to another country or a place or a community. Yeah, I'm really interested in an escape plan. If anyone has an escape plan. I'm really interested um, in that. Um, so if you know anyone who's putting together interesting escape plans, um, I'd like to be, be cool. shared on that information. Um, well, I adore you. I love you. I will see you for dinner and drinks soon. Soon. Um, and we can go play golf and play poker. Golf sounds really fun. I think I'm going to host like a, like a, super baby, maybe even fake, just like educational game for some friends of mine who want to learn. Cause I've been playing these bigger games and it's like fun, but I have so many friends that want to learn and I want to sit at the table with you and, and take your pretend. Well, I love playing poker at your house. The crowd is like, that's like the best group. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll do it again soon. Well, I adore you. I will talk to you soon. I appreciate you for doing this. And, um, I'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye.